VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Jill Robbins answers a question from Luis in Brazil about grammar rules and popular music. Then Gregory Stockel and Gina Bennett tell us about the women weavers of northern Chile. We close today's program with a story by O. Henry. But first, Dan Novak looks at traditional Ethiopian coffee shops in London. When Yared Marcos moved to London 25 years ago, he did not see any Ethiopian coffee shops. Now there are at least 12 around a city known for its tea drinkers. In Ethiopia, coffee is usually drank at the end of each meal. Drinking coffee is a communal activity for Marcos. When he first immigrated to London from Ethiopia 23 years ago, he did not understand the culture. They sell our coffee in Starbucks and other places, but they don't follow our traditions, said Marcos, who has owned Kaffa Coffee since 2004. The shop is now in an East London neighborhood. It holds coffee ceremonies every weekend in the summer. It also holds cultural events and fills special orders. Tourists will walk by and smell the coffee and come in asking questions, Marcos said. It makes people want to learn more about the culture. Among some of the most popular Ethiopian kinds of coffee are the flowery Yirgashef, fruity Limu, and nutty Kochere. Marcos named Kaffa after the southwestern area in Ethiopia where coffee beans are believed to have been discovered about 1,200 years ago. An old story says that an Ethiopian goat farmer once noticed his goats acting strangely one day after eating berries from a tree. He tried them himself and felt energized and awake. The farmer took the berries to a religious worker, a monk, who threw them in a fire, calling them the work of the devil. A strong smell was released, so the monks saved the burnt coffee, putting it in a container with hot water. When they drank the liquid, they realized it helped them stay awake during nightly prayers. Coffee contains a lot of caffeine, a substance that has the effect of keeping people awake and feeling energetic. Over the years, coffee-making in Ethiopia has changed into ceremonies led by the women in households. The social value of the coffee ceremony is one of our biggest traditions, Marcos said. The London Coffee Festival started in 2011. It also provides a chance for coffee lovers to come together. Antene Mulu is one of the owners of the Ethiopian Coffee Company in central London. He said the festival has helped spread Ethiopian coffee to a new community. Mulu and his business partner Polly Hamilton opened their store in 2013. Like Kaffa Coffee, they import directly from Ethiopia where beans are named for the area where they were grown, as Ethiopia's traditions spread outside the country, both Marcos and Mulu hope more people will be pushed to value their community over concerns about drinking caffeine in their coffee. I'm Dan Novak.
Hello. Our question for today on Ask a Teacher comes from a reader in Brazil. I have an easy question. Why does Sir Elton John use don't and not doesn't in the song This Train Don't Stop There Anymore? Thanks. Louise, Brazil. Dear Louise, that's a great question. As an English teacher, I often hear things in songs that do not follow grammar rules. Sometimes, I believe it is because the songwriter wants to speak in a way that is used by another community. Also, informal or everyday language is often not completely grammatical. Let's look at some of the words of This Train Don't Stop There Anymore. It appears in a collection of songs called Songs from the West Coast, published in 2001. The songwriter, Bernie Taupin, co-wrote this and many other songs with Elton John. Taupin wrote the words and John wrote the music. Taupin said he was always interested in Americana, the culture and history of America, and in country and Western music. That helps explain the images and language he put into this song. In the first part, the singer says he does not believe in miracles anymore and has lost strong feelings about romantic love. The second part brings in images of an old kind of train. I used to be the man express All steam and whistles head and west Picking up my pain from door The singer tells us of the strong emotions he once had by comparing them to a fast or express train. The high, sharp sound of a train warning people of its approach is called a whistle. Old trains used to be powered by steam engines that let out whistles as they passed through towns. If we connect these words to the earlier part of the song, we can get a picture in our mind of a lonely, isolated place. A town where the train no longer stops is usually a quiet place with little activity. We can suppose that town is like the singer's heart. My understanding of the song is that the singer is saying he no longer wants to be in love because the feeling is too strong. Continuing the image of the train, he sings... What do you think, Luis? Would the song be just as good if Elton John sang, That train doesn't stop there anymore? Maybe it would not have the quality of informal language Taupin was hoping for. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. Do you have a question for the teacher? Write to us at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins. In northern Chile, Teófila Chalapa learned to weave, or make cloth, surrounded by the high hills and sandy roads of the Atacama Desert. Spin the threads, girl, her grandmother told her fifty years ago. The fifty-nine-year-old Chalapa is Aymara a native South American Indian people. She raises alpacas and llamas. The animal's hair can be cut off and turned into cloth called wool. We had no clothes or money, so we needed to learn how to dress with our own hands, said Chalapa. She lives in Karakima, a town with fewer than 500 people near the Chile-Bolivia border. 
the knowledge of weaving passes from one generation to another, securing a Mara family's connection with their land. Chalapa prays before beginning her work. Mother Earth, give me strength, because you're the one who will produce, not me. Among the three million Aymaras who live along the borders of Chile, Peru, and Bolivia, the Earth is known as Pachamama. Acts to honor Pachamama and asks for Earth's blessings are a part of everyday life for the people. I believe in God, but the Earth provides us with everything, Chalapa said. Pachamama inspires Chalapa's work in textiles. It provides means for survival, too. My animals are my mother, Chalapa said. Her alpacas and llamas were a source of meat, wool, and emotional support during the difficult years she spent as a single parent raising her children. Aymara weavers cut off their animals' wool in October, when the weather is warmer. The llamas keep several centimeters of wool to keep them warm and ready for the floreo. During this ancient ceremony, celebrated in February, Aymaras tie wool flowers to their animals, identifying them as their property. They also thank Pachamama for providing them the things they need. Once the wool is collected and cleaned, the weavers use their fingers to pull threads out of it. The threads are grouped together and placed on a weaving machine called a loom. Amara women like Chalapa use the money they make from the sale of wool products to send their children to school. I thank God because I always told myself, I don't want them to be like me, said Marcelina Choque, another woman weaver who lives in the town of Pozo Almonte. This is my only profession. If I don't sell, I have nothing. Such generational progress comes with mixed emotions, however. I taught my daughters how to weave just like me, but now that they have other jobs, they don't weave anymore, Choke said. Several women weavers say the traditional work may end because younger Aymara are moving away from their hometowns. The weavers say there are few young Aymara women who know how to use a loom. In rural areas, there is a significant migration of young people, and the population is aging, said Luis Pizarro, who works at the Agricultural Development Institute of Chile. The organization supports rural development for Chilean communities connected to the Aymara culture, Pizarro said. The goal is to increase the farming of alpacas and llamas and products through special events and online. Recently, the institute held a fashion show inside a shopping center in the city of Iquique. Teofila Chalapa, Maria Choque, and other women had their daughters serve as models at the show and sold some of their work. We try to get daughters and granddaughters of artisans involved in their cultural inheritance, Pizarro said. Nayareth Chalapa, no relation to Teofila, speaks proudly about her mother, who taught her how to pick the perfect plants for coloring the cloth. 
The colors of our textiles are related to nature, the earth, the sky, the hills. The land is sacred for us, the 25-year-old said. She said the work represents the maker's emotions as well as the llamas, flowers, and mountains she wants to keep present. Nayarith Chalapa moved to a city to attend university like so many others. But home is never far from her heart. When migrating, many forget their ethnicity and leave their roots behind, Chalapa said. But my family tries to avoid that. I'm Gregory Stockel. And I'm Gina Bennett. Hearts and Crosses Baldy Woods reached for a drink and got it. When Baldy wanted something, he usually got it. He... But this is not Baldy's story. Now he took his third drink, which was larger than the first and the second. Baldy had been listening to the troubles of a friend. Now Baldy was going to tell his friend what to do. So the friend was buying him the drinks. This was the right thing for the friend to do. I'd be king if I were you, said Baldy. He said it loudly and strongly. Webb Yeager moved his wide hat back on his head. He put his fingers in his yellow hair and moved it about. It now looked wilder than before. But this did not help him to think better. And therefore, he also got another drink. If a man marries a queen, it ought not make him nothing, said Webb. Here was his real problem. Surely not, said Baldy. You ought to be a king, but you're only the queen's husband. That's what happens to a man in Europe if he marries the king's daughter. His wife becomes a queen, but is he a king? No. His only duty is to appear with the queen in pictures and be the father of the next king. That's not right. Yes, Webb, you are only the queen's husband. And if I were you, I'd turn everything upside down and I would be king. Baldy finished his drink. Baldy, said Webb, you and I have been cowboys together for years. We've been riding the same road since we were very young. I wouldn't talk about my family to anyone but you. You were working on the Nopalito Ranch when I married Santa McAllister. I was foreman then. What am I now? Nothing. Well, when old McAllister was cattle king of West Texas, continued Baldy, you were important. You told people what to do. Your commands were as strong as his. That was true, said Webb, until he discovered that I wanted to marry Santa. Then he sent me as far away from the ranch house as he could. When the old man died, they started to call Santa the cattle queen. Now... I tell the cattle what to do. That's all. She takes care of all the business. She takes care of all the money. I can't sell any cattle, not one animal. Santa is the queen and I... I'm nothing. I would be king if I were you, said Baldy Woods again. When a man marries a queen, he ought to be the same as she is. Plenty of people think it's strange, Webb. Your words mean nothing on the Nopalita Ranch. Mrs. Yeager is a fine little lady, but a man ought to be the head of his own house. Webb's brown face grew long with sadness. With that expression in his wild yellow hair and his blue eyes, he looked like a schoolboy who had lost his leadership to another strong boy. Yet his tall body looked too strong for such a thing to happen to him. I'm riding back to the ranch today, he said. It was easy to see that he did not want to go. I have to start some cattle on the road to San Antonio tomorrow morning. Well, I'll go with you as far as Dry Lake, said Baldy. 
The two friends got on their horses and left the little town where they had met that morning. At Dry Lake, they stopped to say goodbye. They had been riding for miles without talking. But in Texas, talk does not often continue steadily. Many things may happen between words. But when you begin to talk again, you're still talking about the same thing. So now Webb added something to the talk that began ten miles away. You remember, Baldy, there was a time when Santa was different. You remember the days when old McAllister kept me away from the ranch house. Remember how she would send me a sign that she wanted to see me? Old McAllister said that he would kill me if I came near enough. You remember the sign she used to send, Baldy? The picture of a heart with a cross inside it? Me? cried Baldy. Sure, I remember. Every cowboy on the ranch knew that sign of the heart and the cross. We would see it on things sent out from the ranch. We would see it on anything. It would be on newspapers, on boxes of food. Once I saw it on the back of the shirt of a cook that McAllister sent from the ranch. Santa's father made a promise that she wouldn't write to me or send me any word. That heart and cross sign was her plan. When she wanted to see me, she would put that mark on something that she knew I would see. And when I saw it, I traveled fast to the ranch that same night. I would meet her outside the house. Now well, we all knew it, said Baldy. But we never said anything. We wanted you to marry Santa. We knew why you had that fast horse. When we saw the heart and the cross on something from the ranch, we always knew your horse was going to go fast that night. The last time Santa sent me the sign, said Webb, was when she was sick. When I saw it, I got on my horse and started. It was a 40-mile ride. She wasn't at our meeting place. I went to the house. Old McAllister met me at the door. Did you come here to get killed, he said. I won't kill you this time. I was going to send for you. Santa wants you. Go in that room and see her. Then come out here and see me. Santa was lying in bed very sick, but she smiled and put a hand in mine, and I sat down by the bed, mud and riding clothes and all. I could hear you coming for hours, Webb, she said. I was sure you would come. You saw the sign? I saw it, I said. It's our sign, she said. Hearts and crosses, to love and to suffer. That's what they mean. And old Dr. Musgrove was there. And Santa goes to sleep, and Dr. Musgrove touches her face, and he says to me, You were good for her, but go away now. The little lady will be all right in the morning. Old McAllister was outside her room. She's sleeping, I said. Now you can start killing me. You have plenty of time. I haven't anything to fight with. Old McAllister laughs and says to me, Killing the best foreman in West Texas is not good business. I don't know where I could get another good foreman. I don't want you in the family, but I can use you on the Nopalito if you stay away from the ranch house. You go up and sleep, and then we'll talk. The two men prepared to separate. They took each other's hand. Bye, Baldy, said Webb. I'm glad I saw you, and had this talk. With a sudden rush, the two riders were on their way. Then Baldy pulled his horse to a stop and shouted. Webb turned. If I were you, came Baldy's loud voice, I would be king. At eight the following morning, Bud Turner got off his horse at the Nopalita Ranch House. Bud was the cowboy who was taking the cattle to San Antonio. Mrs. Yeager was outside the house putting water on some flowers. In many ways, Santa was like her father, King McAllister. She was sure about everything. She was afraid of nothing. She was proud. But Santa looked like her mother. She had a strong body and a soft prettiness. Because she was a woman, her manners were womanly. But she liked to be queen, as her father had liked to be king. 
Webb stood near her, giving orders to two or three cowboys. "'Good morning,' said Bud. "'Where do you want the cattle to go? "'To barbers, as usual?' "'The queen always answered such a question. "'All the business, buying, selling, and banking, "'had been held in her hands. "'Care of the cattle was given to her husband. "'When King McAllister was alive, "'Santa was his secretary and his helper. "'She had continued her work, "'and her work had been successful. "'But before she could answer, "'the queen's husband spoke. "'You drive those cattle to Zimmerman's and Nesbitt's. "'I spoke to Zimmerman about it. "'Bud turned, ready to go. "'Wait!' called Santa quickly. "'She looked at her husband with surprise in her gray eyes. "'What do you mean, Webb?' she asked. "'I never deal with Zimmerman and Nesbitt. "'Barba has bought all the cattle from this ranch for five years. "'I'm not going to change.' "'She said to Bud Turner, "'Take those cattle to Barber.' Bud did not look at either of them. He stood there waiting. I want those cattle to go to Zimmerman and Nesbitt, said Webb. There was a cold light in his blue eyes. It's time to start, said Santa to Bud. Tell Barber we'll have more cattle ready in about a month. Bud allowed his eyes to turn and meet Webb's. You take those cattle, said Webb, to Barber, said Santa quickly. Let's say no more about it. What are you waiting for, Bud? Nothing, said Bud, but he did not hurry to move away, for man is man's friend, and he did not like what had happened. You heard what she said, cried Webb. We do what she commands. He took off his hat and made a wide movement with it, touching the floor. Webb, said Santa, what's wrong with you today? I'm acting like the queen's fool, said Webb. What can you expect? Let me tell you, I was a man before I married a cattle queen. What am I now? Something for the cowboys to laugh at. But I'm going to be a man again. Santa looked at him. Be reasonable, Webb, she said quietly. There's nothing wrong. You take care of the cattle, I take care of the business. You understand the cattle. I understand the business better than you do. I learned it from my father. I don't like kings and queens, said Webb, unless I'm one of them myself. All right, it's your ranch. Barber gets the cattle. Webb's horse was tied near the house. He walked into the house and brought out the supplies he took on long rides. These he began to tie on his horse. Santa followed him. Her face had lost some of its color. Webb got on his horse. There was no expression on his face except a strange light burning in his eyes. There's some cattle at the Hondo water hole, he said. They ought to be moved. Wild animals have killed three of them. I did not remember to tell Sims to do it. You tell him. Santa put a hand on the horse and looked her husband in the eye. Are you going to leave me, Webb? she asked quietly. I'm going to be a man again, he answered. I wish you success, she said with a sudden coldness. She turned and walked into the house. Webb Yeager went to the southeast as straight as he could ride. And when he came to the place where the sky and the earth seemed to meet, he was gone. Those at the Nopalito knew nothing more about him. Days passed, then weeks. Then months, but Webb Yeager did not return. And that's the Learning English podcast for today. Be sure to come back next week for the next part of the story. Thanks to all our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.